Well, joining me now from Future Cities Project is a good friend of mine. We've met a few times, actually. Uh, and the last time was at a conference that Claire Fox had hosted. And uh, we had a tremendous time up there as well. He's joining me now from Chester, Austin Williams. Austin, how are you? Not too bad, Richard. Lovely to talk to you. Lovely to talk to you. Nice to see the background you have there. <laughs> yeah, well, I internationalist. Uh, yeah. Well, we were hoping to get elected, if you remember, as Brexit Party candidates to this place in London on the green benches, but it didn't happen. But we played our part, Austin, didn't we? Yeah, absolutely, you did. Well, you did a grand job, I have to say. Sterling work, and uh, you continue to do so, uh, as I've noticed. So, so oh, thank keep you very much. Keep uh, good work. Um, Austin, I think it'd be good to start with. Tell us a little bit about what you do with Future Cities Project. Uh, it'd be good to get a little grasp on what it is you actually do. Uh, yeah, well, it's kind of many and varied. Future Cities Project is kind of like a think tank, I suppose, but we don't really lobby government. We just try to encourage uh, more engagement in ideas around the discussions about cities, about transport, about uh, kind of how we live. So there's an environmental conversation, critical engagement with environmentalism, as well as, you know, and try to understand what it is that we could be proposing for the future in terms of our urban centres. It also, you know, takes a look more broadly at China, building cities, as opposed to the West, which isn't building anything in particular at all. So we want to try to understand what the dynamics are, really. Yeah, you come into that. I mean, obviously, I can speak from the context of Wales, as you know, I'm going to anyway. I mean, we've seen very high levels of deprivation for many, many years in Wales. And, you know, we see vanity projects that the Welsh government come out with that have no real change for the people of Wales. You know, this infrastructure that they put in place, really, it, for whatever reason, it doesn't seem to benefit the people of Wales in the way that they they say it's going to you know it's been a reality of many years and I'm just wondering with all that's been going on with the, the Brexit the negotiations the deal this week in, in the news of course did you think that Brexit has indirectly or directly impacted society and in particular our towns and cities? Well I mean at the moment I suppose it's an impact on our ambitions isn't it and there's obviously that there still is that Brexit remain divide. And there are some people who are looking to the past with remain and some people are looking to the future with Brexit. And I think that that positive ambition um, of what society could be like, which was reflected through the, the Brexit vote, changing what we have because we're not satisfied with it and wanting more, um, which I think is a really great ambition for the future. That means that we can now start to challenge what we have. I mean, in the past, it was very much, we were living in deprivation in Wales, but also in the northeast of England and many, many other areas. And we were waiting for government handouts or European handouts or whatever we want to call it. Um, and that, that kind of passivity was really shaken up by Brexit. And I think if we can kind of bottle that attitude and really kind of give it a little bit more expression, then that can have a tremendous impact on demands for what kind of cities, towns, villages, uh, you know, transport infrastructure that we could really start developing. That's what I think is, is good about Brexit. It's not so much a tangible thing, particularly. It's about an ambition which could give rise to more tangible gains. Well, well I think what happened with Boris, really, it, it really bolstered his, his um, majority, of course, through the Brexit campaign, not just to talk about getting Brexit done, but in particular, levelling up, building back better, all those key words and slogans. And I think at the start of his premiership, you know, he started really well. He was saying all the right stuff. And we were all, yes, finally, not only will we get Brexit done, which our country voted for, but more importantly, the language about infrastructure and building and levelling up. It was so positive. But then all of a sudden, we turned the corner from February hit in March and the China virus went man mental, as I, as I call it as well. And all of a sudden, Boris Johnson is now faced with this pandemic that is out of control. We don't have a vaccination for with multiple layers of different lockdowns in different parts of the country, which has been pure madness, if you ask me. I mean, surely, do you think now that Boris has had the wind taken out of his sails because of this pandemic and the whole idea of build back better, levelling up, has been hit with a real big punch? Well, if we rely on Boris to determine what we think and believe and see him as a reflection of all our ambitions, then yes, but obviously he's just a man. And in some ways he's... Um, showed himself to be not up to the task, to be perfectly frank with you. So there's one thing. One is that, you know, as I was saying earlier, that I think that Brexit could have been and still should be the kind of new lease of life for a better world. In some ways, the coronavirus is the kiss of death. So there's this kind of, it's, it's a conflation of these two things coming at once, which obviously completely scuppered 
kind of the ambitions that would have been put forward for 2020, 21 and beyond that Boris had in, in mind. So there's definitely something global which has affected anybody, Boris or whoever would have been in place to kind of put this in, in into, um, into action. But at the same time, there's definitely been a cowardice by central government, Westminster government that is, uh, Mark Drakeford, I don't know whether we should mention that name, but obviously he also has kind of seen shutting down rather than opening up as a kind of a way forward. So all of these things have reinvigorated a different divide from Brexit Remain. There are now different attitudes here about what it is that the society requires in yeah. philosophical, political, and economic terms, as well as just kind of social and health terms. I'm just wondering if the old, the argument of remain and leave really there's there's residue left in in our politics still we see it here in Wales and of course we see it in in national on the national scale as well. I'm just wondering if we've moved on from that with this whole pandemic now and seeing how devolved administrations have been handled as you've just pointed out there, Austin. I wonder if it's becoming more apparent to people that there's a real split within our union within our United Kingdom. You know, seeing Mark Drakeford or the Emperor down at Cardiff Bay as I like to call him, with these draconian measures on the people of Wales, making decisions that are going to obviously affect small, medium-sized businesses and, more importantly, workers and those self-employed without a package of support. The, the Westminster Treasury, UK Treasury, said, look, we, we've not agreed on any support for this lockdown you've gone into. You've done it by yourself. And, you know, but yet the Welsh government make decisions. Then, when they, then they want Westminster to pay for it. And there's been this huge debate here in Wales over what is... Um, has become really um, an obvious thing for people to see that there is a problem with devolution. It doesn't seem to be working in the way that maybe people thought it would. Yeah, and I think that there's, well, I mean, I, I completely agree with what you say there. And even though there's an increased tendency, you see, Boris seems to be kind of proposing uh, that not having a national lockdown seems to be his only objective because Keir Starmer and the Labour Party want one. So by implementing as harsh a measures as you want, as long as you don't say national lockdown, you can be portray yourself as a liberal, kind of irony, irony upon irony. But by doing that, you're also then giving what could be seen to be giving authority to local regions, increasing local democracy. So that could be seen as a positive thing. However, you then find that you are giving vent to local dictatorships, petty politicking, these little Hitlers who are now been kind of cropping up all over the place from Manchester through to Wales, as we've said, and Scotland, obviously. There are, there's an empowerment which has taken place, which is not not the same as taking control, but rather demanding aid. It's almost like you know, we want to say whatever we want to say, but you have to pay for it. So there's no kind of um, um, autonomy. There's no agency. There's, no, there's none of that. This is very much a kind of a passive demand mechanism of relying on central government and, a, and an eternal money tree which is running out, God knows where that money is going to come from, and, and the next generation are going to suffer badly for this. Yeah, I, I think uh, the words of the Iron Lady herself on socialism was, you know, socialism is okay when you're spending somebody else's money, but what happens when you run out of it? That, that's the problem, isn't it? Now, I know you were a great fan of that, and she's not loved by many people in Wales, but it's a, short, it's a kind of a socialist agenda, isn't it? You know, we, we want to do all these things, but we need someone to pay for it, and we'll take handouts where we can. I mean, do you think that's what's happening to you, especially in the context of Wales? Uh, I don't see anything socialist in uh, locking people in their houses. I mean, if you want to parody that as Stalinist, I'm more than happy to go with you, right? <laughs> but there's nothing socialist about it. I mean, I'm an old lefty, right? But I never had much truck with the Labour Party, still don't. Um, and I see myself independent of party kind of uh, pet petty politicking. It's more about what is it that we need and whoever's saying you know anything constructive and progressive, I'm kind of going to listen to them or, or at least give them the time of day to see where we're going. But I do think that you know the handout mentality, which I don't think is necessarily socialist in, in its very essence, but that is becoming the almost the the, um, the the mantra of everybody across the country, from businesses through to, to local governments to uh, um, you know, devolved administrations. Yeah demanding a handout from from where because the productive economy which actually makes the wealth is now being shut down so I, I don't know why nobody sees this irony there is a madness somebody was saying recently in parliament that no wonder conspiracy theories are on the up and up mm. it's because anybody with a rational mind 
is actually trying to work out what the hell is going on. And they're coming up with all kinds of weird solutions. So it's rationalism is leading to conspiracy because nobody can understand this madness. Yeah, since you just say that, I was, I was listening to uh, the Chancellor this week, uh, you know, the new scheme he's bringing in to support businesses and self-employed. And you go back to March when the furlough scheme was brought in as well. There were such generous packages. And I remember at the start of it, Austin, thinking to myself, there's no way this can continue. As you say, there's no monetary, you know, we're, we're billions and billions of pounds of borrowing that we've already acquired, and it's going to get more and more, as we know. I mean, how are we going to support this? Inevitably, there's going to be a point where we say enough is enough. And I think the balance between opening up the economy and the health of those who are vulnerable and elderly, there, there's a balance to be had. But I think I, I, I want to, I want to, I'm trying to answer the question, really. Where's, what's the end game here? Where, where's it all going? Because eventually... You know, we're going to have to pull the plug on the whole thing, stop giving handouts, lift the lockdown, and everyone go back to some kind of, because I refuse to accept the new normal, you know, where we have to wear masks all the time, we have to do all this stuff. Because I'll tell you quite frankly, I believe that I had the virus back in December. And I believe I'm, I, I built up immunity to it. That's just my opinion. It, it doesn't mean I act foolishly and I don't, you know, follow the law and stuff. Of course I do. But what is the end game here? You know, are we just waiting, hanging on for a vaccination? Is, is that the answer? Well, there is no end game. And in certain respects, the virus gives legitimacy or gives purpose to government. I mean, so, so the continuation of the virus actually gives them a certain kind of cachet in bringing out legislation or bringing out um, but going back to your But going back to your original point, isn't that a conspiracy theory you see, Austin? <laughs> you know what I mean? No, no, no. I mean, there's, there's, real, there's real things that, that happen. I, mean, I don't mean that's a conscious policy. Yeah. I mean, it's a completely defensive, unconscious policy because they have nothing else to offer, right? So you have to kind of keep this thing going, right? There is a certain, um, there's a, a certain truth to that, I think. I don't, I mean, look, in terms of having the virus, I, I'm hearing more and more and more of people who are saying, I was really sick in October last year and, and all the rest of it, and it sounded like coronavirus. Who knows? I mean, I don't doubt that there will be weird and wonderful revelations coming out of this when we finally have our inquiry. Um, but I, I, can't, I can't necessarily comment on that. But in terms of the, you know, the end point, there is no end point because they've built up such defensiveness and um, a, 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 a doubt within society that even when a virus comes out, there will be people who will say this doesn't work or we have to give it longer to kind of bed in or whatever it might be. This could go on and on and on. And this is, a, this is the point I was trying to make. It's not so much that this is a conscious conspiracy. It's more the fact that without this, without the legitimization of the virus, then the austerity and the cutbacks and the devastation, which is going to be called, will be very, very stark. If you can legitimate it, legitimate it on the back of public health, and therefore you have to pay more, et cetera, et cetera, then at least they will have some um, excuse. Uh, that's a good point. I think the impact that it's had on some of our communities, you know, not just with the, the, the way that the NHS has been impacted. I mean, I was sent a photo this morning, actually, uh, someone sent to me of empty ICU units in, in hospitals with hardly any patients whatsoever. And then, you know, we've been told, on the other hand, there's, there's, that the NHS is going to be impacted massively. I mean, sometimes it's hard to know who to believe. And I think politicians are making decisions, sometimes scientifically, you know, they're supposed to be led by the science. But then I see what Matt Rick has done down here in Cardiff. And sometimes I wonder if he, if he listens to the science at all. And then there's other times where I think he's listening to it too much. It must be difficult for any government to handle a pandemic that they didn't ask for, they didn't expect, and they have no vaccination for. But the, the, the end game of this, which we don't know what it is, I wonder what, what can we realistically look at doing to revive some of our communities? Because let's be quite frank here in Wales in particular and in the north of England, we, the levels of deprivation and poverty have been very, very high for a number of years. Let's forget who was in power and why for a moment. How would any government revive some of our most deprived communities? Where should they start? What should be the first thing they should do? Well, in some, in some respects, they should butt out rather than intervene. Um, I mean, I appreciate that there is, you know, money is always handy, but I don't think that's the be all and end all of a community revival. In some ways, it's, an, it's negation of a community. It's an, it's an addition of the aid budget, which is a passive recipient and you only become a community because you are 
um, you know, engaged in collective acceptance of that aid. So for communities to actually have any meaning, they ought to have autonomy and they ought to be able to make their own decisions. And it's kind of, a, in some ways, a reinvention of that kind of local democratic ideal, which is people coming together to make decisions. Um, so, I mean, I'm, a, I'm in favour of you and your abolish kind of ambitions to get rid of the Senate. That doesn't mean I want to get rid of all local democratic engagement within Wales. It does mean I want to get rid of this kind of massive um, industry of bureaucracy, of payments going nowhere, of talking shops doing nothing, but I'm getting back to what real democratic engagement might mean. And that actually probably means a more hands-off approach than a hands-on one. So I don't, I don't have the answers, obviously, but I'm just saying that. No, well, a... well, I mean, we're, we're just in Chester there, not too far from Manchester, is it? I mean, my geography is not that great outside of Wales, but yeah. I was just thinking there, you know, Andy Burnham, had a case, you know, he was saying, look, we, we want more money. Some called it an ego trip. You know, I, I have my own opinion on that. And I, I think he was looking for smaller government, you know, more money to deal with it on a local level. But I, I, I still don't see how that's the answer. I think a one nation approach, you know, one United Kingdom, one approach. I get the fact that there's hot spots in different parts of the region. But, you know, given the way that devolved administrations have worked here in Wales, and I have seen for two decades the way that they have failed the people of Wales, it's become a, an issue for me, whereas I've always believed in local government, you know, and hands off from central government, you know, coming out of the EU was part of that. We don't want to be sending money to an institution and them dictating to us what we do. So I kind of I'm on a journey myself with this because I've, I've seen what it's done to the people in Wales. And I, that's why I struggle with what you're saying. In principle, I've always agreed with it, but I don't see it working here in Wales, Austin. Well, I mean, uh, as we say, let's maybe we should try it and find out, and we will learn some very valuable lessons. But I'm, I'm more. It's like it's like the pandemic. I, I'm a great believer in Sweden trying its own way of dealing with it, uh, and Britain and America and goodness knows who trying different things because only by trying different things will we work out which is the right one. If we all do the same thing, we'll never, and it fails, then we're in trouble. So I think that there's lots of experimentation which you know we should adapt that mentality that rather than being risk averse, we should be a little bit more experimental in all that we do in, in our government, as well as our, um, you know, the way that we handle uh, the economy and all the rest of it. But I also coming back to what you say, I think that there's, there's, there's a, a sense of um, purpose, which has been lost over many, many years as it happens about what it is that Britain represents. The idea of the UK more broadly than just Wales, um, and I think that, you know, the, putting an agenda about taking back control, to use that terrible phrase, or sovereignty, or the idea that we actually formulate policy and we have a stake in it, right? To do that, you have to have a certain sense of purpose. Brexit released that, right? And that's what I'm trying to say. It wasn't, Brexit wasn't about giving people money in order to vote the right way. As a matter of fact, Wales, which gets the most you, you money, voted against it, right? That shows a real, you know, um, attitude. That shows a real purpose of wanting to change and actually have a much more engaged role in the way that society develops. If you can create a certain sense of dynamic within society of what people really want, which is what local democracy, central democracy, you know, devolved administration should be about, uh, then I think we can start to reinvigorate a certain sense of engagement. That's what I'm saying. Well, I, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, you said a lot there, really, but I was just uh, just want to kind of bring the interview to a close. And I know time's gone really quick and it's not it's not a long one. We're on YouTube, but most of you, I hope you're still watching, by the way. Um, if you haven't hit subscribe yet, hit that subscribe button. Um, the way that the pandemic's been handled by devolved administrations, local government, different regions. Um, is, is there a case to be had, do you think, uh, Austin? I know you, you're a Welshman um, and a well. Welshman as well. I know. And I was just wondering... Do you think there's a case then, the way that things have been handled for this pandemic, it's highlighted some of the real issues of devolution and whether or not there is a case for uh, to end devolution, and just your opinion I want on this, and to return to the power to Westminster? You know, that, that's really the question. Um, well, it's a bit of a tricky one because I've just spent half an hour explaining how <laughs> bloody awful Westminster has been. That's, in this why, that, that's, that's the challenge. Isn't it? <laughs> that's the challenge. Yeah. So there's, you know, we really need to kind of re-engage politically with all of these kind of tiers of, of government is what I'm try trying to say. And that engagement is a much more dynamic one of the individuals in the locality rather than it being an enforced one or a paid for one or, or an aid budgeted one. But I think that there's a, a tension. So there is, as I'm, I think I said earlier, there is this tension towards more devolution because the central government is going kind to of giving it up. 
there's a, a tendency for more power to the devolved regions precisely because they, they, they're showing up the central government for their inadequacies and demanding much more of a role for themselves to re reflect on the local areas. So that's that area. But, it, but of recent weeks, months, there has also been the fact that people have recognized how idiotic some of these clowns are, right? So, you know, even though it might be Andy Burnham, maybe flavor of the month for a couple of days, when you realize the machine of laborite bureaucracy that he runs within Manchester and the money that's been spent not on Deliveroo drivers that he kind of um, weeps crocodile tears over all the time, but on this kind of massive industry, which is now local government, mm. or Drakeford, or wherever it might be, these people are now actually slightly undermining their very own argument because people are seeing it for what it is, which is a huge bureaucratic machine which really needs to be put back in its place. Fantastic. Well, our time is up. Austin, I know it's gone really quick, and you've got to go to the opticians, I believe, as well. But just one, one more thing before you go. Nigel Farage on the Brexit party, do you think he's going to come back? I hope not. <laughs> 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 Brexit, Brexit's done. Brexit's done. One yeah. of the, I mean, as he's been recognised, one of the most significant players in British political history. Yeah. I give him all credit for that. But he's got nothing to say about coronavirus. Where, where is he now? So, I mean, no offence, Nigel, but um, you've played yeah. your role magnificently. But now it's time to hand yeah. it over to other players. Yeah, it's the same here in Wales. The Brexit Party has served its mandate. They've dissolved now here. As you know, the group is no more. Mark Reckless, I had him on the show uh, earlier this week. Um, or last week, I should say. And, you know, it seems as if the mandate's been fulfilled. And I think Nigel has played a huge, significant role in the political landscape of our country. He's helped to give the Conservatives a majority. We got rid of Theresa May. So we all know those successes. But I, like you, feel as if the, that mandate's been fulfilled and, and it's the end of an era. And, I, I, and I'm grateful for the experiences we had. I got to meet you as well, Austin, because of the, the whole Brexit party. And uh, it's, thanks for coming on today. I really appreciate it. And just sharing some of your thoughts on some of the issues we talked about post-Brexit, our cities, our communities, and how do we revive it, and local government. There's a lot of stuff in there. So I want to say thank you very much for tuning in today, folks. And I hope you enjoyed. You can check Austin out on social media. Um, he's on Twitter quite a bit as well. He's got a lot of stuff going on there. And Future Cities Project. Be sure to check them out. They've got some books, some great articles, and lots of stuff on their website. Thanks for tuning in on a Wednesday night. I'll catch you on Friday on Rich Politics. Thank you.